Okay, great, thanks. So, I don't think that's me. Ah, great. So I am going to summarize what ENCODE has been doing for the last 10 or 12 years. <clears throat> okay, in 15 minutes. So as Elise said, um, really what we've been doing is throwing a large variety of different assays with the goal of trying to functionally annotate the genome. These are mostly biochemical assays. And I won't go through every single one, but they basically are intended to map transcription factor binding sites, open chromatin, three-dimensional organization. <clears throat> uh, there's some DNA methylation experiments, a lot of RNA-seq experiments, and then some uh, um, RNA binding protein analyses associated types of experiments. <clears throat> And basically, the overall structure of this is that, um, this is a slide stolen from Ewan, but updated. Uh, the idea is that actually there's been a large number of different assays, meaning different chip seq experiments against different transcription factors, different ribosome binding protein, on a very limited number of cell lines. I'll dig into this in more detail in a minute. And then there's been a fewer number of assays thrown across a lot of different biosamples, different cell lines or different tissue specimens and such, so that you have um, <clears throat> Again, a, a more focus set there with the ultimate goal of trying to extract as much information as possible and at least learn basic principles from these sorts of studies. And so at the end of the day, there's roughly this many experiments done so far, and each experiment you'll see has a replica. Uh, these are the major ones that are there. And the total number of experiments is listed up here. So there's over 3,000 experiments that ENCODE has generated that are sitting in the public databases. I think this is updated as of February. Um, I just got an email this morning from Shirley Liu, and if you ask how many other sets of data are out there that aren't ENCODE or MC, the number with replicas is, best as I can tell from her email, is about 1,000. So that's of transcription factor binding site. I don't have RNA-seq experiments where I imagine there's a lot. And there's a few hundred DNA experiments. So basically, the rest of the community combined with re their replicate experiments, as far as I can tell, is roughly the same as ENCODE. Uh, and I can't speak to the quality of those data sets. OK, what I can speak to is the quality of our data sets, which we believe to be very high quality because a lot of effort was put in uh, to make sure we had reasonable um, experiments. We demanded that there be at least two biological replicate experiments for each thing, this seems obvious now, but imagine yourself in 2003 when we launched this. Actually, first of all, most experiments didn't have replicates. And second, half the ones that were published actually gave background levels of uh, information. That, um, I don't know if you remember those days. Again, as someone who was there at the beginning, uh, a lot of the data was basically noise. Okay, And so I think this is why we installed these. And remember, that was chip-chip days. That was a lot tougher for those things. So anyway, we've added lots of quality control measures. There's been some nice algorithms and approaches that have been added, which I've actually spread through the community, as you'll see in a minute, to make sure we had replicate peaks that were being called, that the, each experiment, in fact, had good quality data. There are various measures you can do to actually follow that. Uh, and so, again, these were all installed, and so we think it is high quality data for the most part. Uh, and then we also set up, there's some, as you'll see in a minute, standards for uh, ensuring high quality experiments are being performed and importantly all the data is being processed in a uniform fashion so that you can actually compare data from different labs for the first time and, um, and these are some of the steps involved the mapping the uniform peak calling QC I mentioned already and actually you can drive uh, information from this and actually this pipeline is now spread into other projects so it's had impact on GTEx, REMC, IHEC and other projects that are outside of NIH. For example, there's a CIRM grant that Joe and I are part of, uh, the Beta Cell Consortium, that is NIH, have all used ENCODE standards for, for processing data and bringing this out. So it's really having impact, again, very broadly. Uh, we've set up a lot of standards for carrying out these experiments. These literally took years to work out. Uh, they were very painful. Uh, and nonetheless, though, at the end, we came up with what we think are good ways of generating data and set up guidelines so that, again, p information be compared across labs uh, and across projects. These are in a little more detail about the types of data we've been generating. So I won't go through every one, but you can see it's a diverse array of data. There's a log scale. Blue is what we've done so far. Red is what's coming, or at least what people said they're going to do over the next year and a half. 
And even though these bars look tiny here, there are actually many more experiments to come in some cases than are here currently. And so you can anticipate, I forgot what the final number is, but it's, it's, it's probably about two or threefold more over what we have now uh, that's been generated. And again, there's quite a few samples that have been generated for the mouse. This is human, this is mouse, okay? Uh, once again, there's lots and lots of assays that have been run on smaller numbers of lines and biosamples, and this is the number one hits, if you will, the number of assays that have been run on, on various cell lines. And so here are four cell lines, three of which are cancer. Uh, liver didn't quite make the list. That one actually got added in ENCODE 3. It is starting to accumulate more data. That would be the one tissue that's starting to pile up. But otherwise, these are, in fact, uh, cell lines. Uh, for, um, as I said before, li more limited number of assays have been run on lots of samples. So RNA-seq has been run on over 200 samples. Uh, ChIP-seq's a little, little misleading because it's a hodgepodge of factors. But dna has been run on close to 200, most from John Stam's lab. Histone marks on a number and so forth. So these limited assays have been run on lots of different samples. The net result is that um, there is a lot of analyses on different samples, so even if they are smaller in number, they're still reaching a wide range of samples. So primary cells, immortalized cells, and tissues are getting hit pretty reasonably, again, with a more limited number of assays uh, for both human and mouse. So the data, as I think Elise mentioned, is all up on the cloud. In fact, so are some of the algorithms you can use for actually processing and analyzing the data. Uh, that's in the cloud. And Mike Cherry set this up in a very highly searchable format. Um, one important thing, this is a new part of ENCODE, as part of this phase, the data actually is instantly released. That is, there's no embargo. So as soon as the data is up there, you can release it. I think they'd appreciate it if you talk to some of the producers, but you don't have to. You can publish it straight up. This is the portal site, probably the most important thing from this talk, so you can browse a bit. My understanding, by the way, is a lot of the summary here is in your packet. So if I'm going quickly, please look at that pack, packet. Uh, there's a first generation, if you will, simplification of some of this data to set up a, a simplified annotation, what we're calling a prototype for the encyclopedia. Mark Gerstein and others are part of that effort uh, to put this um, into a, a simplified version many people can use in case you're overwhelmed by all the different data and all the different cell types. Oops. Okay. As Elise mentioned, there are a number of computational groups that are heavily involved in analyzing the data, and I've broadly grouped them into three areas. Uh, that might be an oversimplification, but basically these are some of the areas in which there's extensive activity going for analyzing ENCODE data. And these various computational groups, along with the production groups, have generated over 30 different algorithms that are out there and publicly available, and there's a website I should have put up here that will actually uh, list where these are. Now, I know most computational biologists hate to use each other's algorithms, but a few of these have actually merged. So, in fact, they're getting used widely by uh, the world, which is nice to see. That's, a, I would call it, a remarkable achievement in and of itself. Okay, so here's a summary of the impact. I think we have lots of open and diverse data types on the same cell lines and tissues, so people actually do use this. You can think of, the, especially the heavily studied ones, as reference cell lines, and that's what a lot of people do, where they do dig very deeply to try new kinds of analyses and such. We've had strong impact on setting up experimental standards, new analysis methods, and these methods and standards, again, have been widely adopted by the community, and the data are widely utilized. I think Elise showed the slide already, but this is the number of publications from ENCODE. Purple are the ENCODE folks. So if you take those out and you look at non-ENCODE folks who are publishing, you still have a fairly heavy dose of information that's getting used and over 750 papers. And over 200 of those are actually disease associated. So it's having impact on human disease. And there's also a related set from Mod ENCODE coming out that are, uh, these are papers that have been published by non-Mod ENCODE people. This is just some of the disease areas where these papers fall. Again, wide range of disease with cancer showing up quite a bit. Uh, we have a variety of outreach activities to try and get the information out to the community. So there are tutorials here, and I'm told they're quite good. Uh, we've had workshops uh, that have helped uh, set up relationships with other groups that we think would take advantage of ENCODE data. And there will be a users meeting uh, this year. I think it's this summer. 
Other high level impact that's occurred is summarized here. Uh, we can now view the genome as sitting in interesting segmental elements uh, um, that you can look at. I think this information has been useful for helping to organize certain regulatory principles you can think about. So there's a series of papers that came out in the last burst of ENCO papers. But this is arguably one of the most high impact areas where ENCODES had value. Just to reiterate what's been said already, at least 85 percent, if not more, of SNPs from G or GWAS associated SNPs, lead SNPs, do lie outside of coding regions. And so you can actually start scanning some of these SNPs and see where they lie relative to ENCO peaks and get excited if one of your lead peak falls on top. But more often than not, um, it can be a situation like this where you'll have a lead SNP that's somewhere in the genome and then you have to look in a larger linkage equilibrium, this linkage disequilibrium block and try and find a better uh, area that might better match uh, what your uh, a candidate uh, region causative SNP might be, and, and this is a case from something we looked at where there was a SNP, lead SNP for type 2 diabetes, but actually the most striking candidate was over here where there was a lot of ENCODE data suggesting an NFAC transcription factor binding site lay, which might be the more causative uh, or a, micro, a stronger candidate for being involved in the disease. So this is one way, again, I think many of you are familiar with this, but this is one way in which these data can be used. Um, Actually, just reflecting back a little bit where we were in 2003 when the genome was finished and ENCODE was launched, this was our view of the genome, 25,000 protein coding genes. Not that many non-coding genes, uh, mostly tRNAs, no RNAs, and some, uh, a few small RNA genes, things like that. And there really wasn't very much regulatory information mapped in the human genome. Fast, fast forward to where we are now, well, the number of protein coding genes probably dropped a little bit. Uh, there are, in fact, thousands of non-coding genes that are quite reproducible, and some of which have been ascribed function, not necessarily all of them. And they're certainly now thanks to, not entirely thanks to, or not entirely due to ENCODE, but certainly ENCODE has, has had a big part in actually mapping regulatory segments throughout the genome, and now we appreciate the many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of regulatory, potential regulatory elements throughout the human genome. Uh, which I think gives us a somewhat different view from what we had 12 years ago. So those are some of my thoughts about what we've done to summarize. And again, Elise showed this picture, but here are the groups that did this. Um, and I think I made it in 15 minutes. Okay. You and I'm, I'm really impressed by the 800 transcription factors. Um, how, did you, um, how did you scale that? And um, uh, what is the, is, is there anything that's coming out from that in terms of the, the you know, 800 is really a, a sizable level where you can start thinking about Yeah, it's themes. even bigger than I realize. I've got to go see where they all are. <laughs> um, what can I say? I think some things that have helped a lot, we've actually switched into more automated mode, and Rick can comment on his, but we now do things in a 96-well format. And so um, our production rate just in the last six months is threefold higher than it was before. That doesn't sound like a lot, but in certain things like transcription factors and salaries, that's a good thing. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, is it still all antibody-based, the, um, uh, the kind of... Yes, yeah, so there is some tagging going on. That hasn't been quite as high throughput as we had hoped. Okay. Uh, so there's tagging with GFP lines from Kevin White. I didn't present all that here, and that has led to some. Um, but it's mainly antibodies. That's impressive. What's that? It's mainly antibodies. Uh, it's mostly antibodies. It does seem high to me, too, to be honest. I think it also counts chromatin remodeling. Okay. proteins and things like that. So it's not all pure TFs. Yeah. It would certainly have other RNA polymerase subunits and things like that. Uh, it's a slide I got from um, Brenton. What's that? What color was the 800, blue or red? <laughs> it, it, was, it was black. No, it's <laughs> to be fair, the these were supposed red. to be ones that were done. Right. So according, um, according to Brenton, they're done. He's the one who pulled all the data together. It sounds high to me, too, I have to say. I think a decimal place got kind of mixed in there somehow or another. No, I'd, it's more than I, 86, I, that I know. No, I'm yeah. joking. But, yeah. but it's, um, 
I'd be surprised if the number is that high because I mean that, it does seem you high. and you you know this, but the antibody success rate has always been poor and it's gotten kind of worse for both of our groups. I think yeah. and probably well, others. we can check it in. So, um, but it, it is a lot. It's just though. I'm not sure what the, the actual number is. Um, I know when I last looked at it uh, two years ago, it was about 200. Yeah. So. Yeah, Frank. Yeah, um, actually, I wanted to, if you could speak to that antibody quality issue. Um, maybe two questions. Yeah, anecdotally, I always hear about antibody quality being poor, but how, how does that factor in? I know there's antibody checks, but are they keeping up with the amount of data being produced, and, and is it just being reported, like, the antibody quality, or is it really being linked in, in a meaningful way to, to data quality? Yeah, good question. With regards to the latter, all of the antibody characterization data is now getting posted, so you can actually look at it yourself for the Western blot or the mass spectra and things. So all the metadata associated with an antibody characterization will be associated with each of these experiments. So, so that part you can follow. On the issue about keeping up, I think there's mixed opinions uh, how <laughs> we're doing. I think Rick feels that there aren't as many good ones. Our group so far hasn't had, we're not limited yet by antibodies, although will we be? Um, I'm not so sure. There's a lot of groups that are still producing them. But it is true that you, we characterize four times as many antibodies as actually become successful for CHIP. That is to say, only 25% of the antibodies we start out with we deem suitable for a good chip experiment. So that means you're characterizing, um, you know, for hundreds of factors, you're characterizing thousands of antibodies. And now, we didn't used to, but now we actually keep track of those that fail. So they are put up there along with their lot numbers and such, so you don't have to make the same $300 mistake we did. Yeah, let, let me comment about that. I know this is technical detail, but it is, may be important to some people, is that we did start seeing a decline. Mike's group, our group, um, buy as many antibodies from as many different companies as we can. We've made a few, too. And we saw a, at least a two-fold drop in success rate um, over the last year or so. We did. Mike's group didn't, but we did from the groups that we're buying from. And we think it's because the earlier ones were vetted. You know, they had been tested at least some. You never trust a company when they say it's chippable because that, whatever that means. But, but, um, but, the, um, but some of them clearly had at least been tested somewhat. So I yeah. think that may be why. Yeah. I think in general, you know, we can give you some rules, but the polyclonal ones have worked better than the monoclonal ones and such, yeah. Ross? And uh, I, wanted, I wanted to follow up on that, because I, I think regardless of, of what the, the, the actual decline in success rate is, I mean, there is a, a decline, it raises the question of whether or not antibodies are going to enable, whether or not there are going to be enough good antibodies to really cover the space that we want to, to, to hit. At, and, of course, there, there's t tagging methods uh, uh, can, can be applied, right. and, and they have their own but, uh, uh, issues, but you know the antibody will work. Yeah, yeah well, I, maybe people know this, maybe they don't, but there is a common fund initiative to make these that has not generated them at the levels we have been hoping for. Uh, and obviously that would have been nice. There's huge value to having a renewable antibody reagent that works forever because it is renewable, you can use it on any tissue or what have you versus tagging where you're not going to go around tagging humans. Um, you can tag cell lines, but you won't. So these are the issues you're, you're facing. So there, I don't think the, the value of having good capture agents is going to go away. I think that's always going to remain extremely high. It's incredibly high in other fields like proteomics and things where you start finding markers and you really need a high quality antibody. So I think it's, it's still strong in many communities that we need such reagents. Um, it just may take more work to get them. And I think there are creative ideas uh, for doing this, just like there are creative ideas for new sequencers, and we need to keep exploring those. Yeah. Okay, I'm not sure who wants to go next, but okay. I had a, a quite provocative question for you. When, when do you call it a day? I mean, we, we have now so many hundred. Uh, they're all in MCF7 or HeLa, where most of them don't belong. How far are you going with this? Uh, the whole 1,600 or? Well, that, or? that's the goal. I don't know if we're going to make that in 2016. <laughs> this is an interesting discussion we have with Lise quite frequently. Um, 
So uh, obviously when things aren't expressed in these relevant cell types, we try and move into other cell types. That's why not everything is done in those four cell types. The, the, there was a goal initially to pick six. Um, we never quite got that sixth human sample done. But there's liver in these other four that are very high priority for us, and so we've been trying to do that. They were chosen in part because they're fairly diverse, and we thought lots of TFs would be expressed in those cells. And so that does give us a fair amount of leverage. But it is true that we'll probably have to go into other systems. And in some cases, for example, you may have to do human fetuses or what have you, early development, or, or do some creative things with stem cells. We haven't done perturbation experiments. This is always uh, something discussed as well. So we are monitoring this to, at some level to see where there are cells where there's still a big hole and where we don't have transcription factor binding information and which cell lines would help maximize that. So I think that is one thing to consider going forward in the future. I think another thing, and maybe this is inserting my bias before Joe speaks, but I could easily envision us choosing other reference lines as well. You know, these, some of these were chosen for historical reasons and they work well and you can also, they're transfectable and people were working with these and we can now think it's a different world in 2015 than it was in 2003. Maybe some other lines or tissues would be better references than the ones we're using now. I don't want to color the argument yet, so I think that'll come later. But these are things you could think about, some of which would then help fill out the remaining parts that were missing. Uh, getting back at your question, and others would just be useful to the community as references as well. That's something to consider. Aravinder? I was just going to ask, you know, a cheap way to find out is, is the thing to do is there are thousands of, you know, scientists who use antibodies on their own favorite primary cell line or cell type or tissue, and there has been no consistent way of mining that information, and I don't know that given how ENCODE is now being used, uh, whether there's some way to find out their experience. All they have to do is tell you whether the antibody is chippable and how good the evidence is, which Right. They can be excellent in, in giving you that information. Yeah, so two comments there is we did try, we put out calls to folks. If you have an antibody, we'll chip it for you and give you the information back. So we have put that kind of um, request out there. And some people have taken us up on it, but not as much as I had hoped. The other comment I can make is um, Rick has the same, well, I guess three comments. We have interface with all the antibody producing companies, and some actually give us very low cost antibodies because we are doing high throughput. In return, they get information back about how good their antibody is, which they like. So we have interfaces certainly with all the major producing companies. The third thing I can say is there's something called um, an Antibodypedia. No, it's, ana it's not Antibodypedia. Um, is it Antibodypedia? Anyway, it's the Human Protein Atlas Associated Resource. So there, that is a crowdsourcing um, area where you're supposed to put information about this on, but very little of that's chip related, as you may know. It's more immunostaining and immunoprecipitations. So, yeah. Time for maybe one more question. I would just say so we've heard that there's some, some issues with chipping transcription factors, but as an outside user, it's one of the most amazing resources that ENCODES has to offer. It's really unique to ENCODE, so whatever needs to be done, I think, should definitely be uh, done to make sure that we keep plowing through more transcription factors and more cell lines. Oh, that's great to hear. Thanks.